The Department of Veterans Affairs has estimated that fewer than two million American World War II veterans are still alive. Deaths are estimated to range between 700 and 1,100 every single day. Alicia Nu is on a mission to record as many of these stories on film as possible before these national treasures are all gone. Hi, I'm Alicia New. Welcome to Heroic Conversations. What we're doing in this series is recording some important conversations, some important stories that I realized that I've heard my whole life because my dad, who's 86, has been telling them to me. And they're all these great stories about World War II. We were sitting at a doctor's appointment one day and he was sitting beside another guy who was a World War II vet. And I believe the other guy was 91, my dad's 86 and they just started feeding off of each other, telling these wonderful stories. And I thought, you know, we've got to get this down on film for to record for these, this generation because this generation does not know what these guys went through firsthand. So that's what we're doing here at Heroic Conversations. And of course, I'm starting with my dad in the first one and another great gentleman here, Mr. Ed Meadows. Tell everybody what years you were in the service. Well, I entered the U.S. Navy in 1944. I was still a little 17-year-old boy, and I wanted to go in the service, but I didn't want to be drafted and have to get in the Army and walk in that mud and water. <laughs> so I easily influenced my mother and daddy to sign for me to go in. And I don't know whether they just wanted to get rid of me or, or what, <laughs> but they did sign for me to go in. And how long were you in for? I was stayed in the, uh, about about 25 months and 11 days. Yeah, I think you had it down to almost the hours that you counted until well, you got I'm out. Well, I'm going to tell you the 13 hours. Right, <laughs> we know that too. We also have Ed Meadows here. Now tell everybody what branch you were in. I and was in the uh, U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. At that time, in 1942, it was called the Army Air Force. And I enlisted in 19 in the spring of 1942, okay. and I entered into a glider pilot program at Rollins College in Winter Park. Mm -hmm. And how long did you stay in? And I stayed in from 42 until the end of World War II in 45, and then I re-enlisted in the Air Force Reserve, and I was at FSU in the ROTC building and that's where I had the training in the Air Force Reserve Program. And I stayed in the Air Force Reserve Program until I was 60 years old. What were you thinking when you first, when the war, you know, was going strong, when you first were deployed, what was the first thing that went through your mind? Well, the first thing that went through my mind, I had a, a young girlfriend that was five years younger than I was. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I remember now when we got the news that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, mm -hmm. I said, well, it looks like that I'll be going to war before long, you know. And that's the first time that I really realized that I would be a part of World War II. I don't think she realized what the seriousness of the whole country was, but uh, I soon found out. I don't think anybody did, right, yeah, going right. in. Now, what about you? What was going through your mind? I'd never been out of nowhere but North Florida and Alabama and Georgia, so <laughs> I thought I had left the world when they got me up to Virginia and Rhode Island and old places like that. And that was a long, long ways from Tallahassee, Florida. And you were in the Navy now. Tell me what your specific job was in the Navy. Well, I was a radarman. Back then, radar was sort of a top secret, mm -hmm. and they asked to me they would go send me to radar school. I said, what's radar? They said, that's where you can see these airplanes in the sky way off, and ships way off. And it sounded a little interesting, <coughs> but they said, we're going to send you to school now, mm -hmm. but you can't write down nothing. you got to keep it all in your head, because it's a top military secret. So. That suited me just fine. I didn't like to ride anyhow. <laughs> and your primary responsibility at the radar was? Well, my primary during, during the battle was uh, the director. Mm -hmm. We had a lieutenant there that would talk to the fighter planes and give them their orders. And my job was to do everything on paper that they told them to do. When they'd go into orbit, they'd, 
Most of it was five mile circle. It's primarily at night, right? You... Yeah, this is all night. I just worked night shift. Daytime, <laughs> I didn't have nothing to do with sleep. We were the eyes and ears uh, at Okinawa because they, uh, at that base, we captured that right off the bat from the land. That's a big responsibility for a 17-year-old. But, <laughs> but at well, that time, I had turned 18 during oh, the Battle of Okinawa, mm -hmm. but I enjoyed doing what I did because I'd tell that pilot, I said, oh, I said you, you were right over the air base now. And he'd look out and say, there it is. You <laughs> got in there That'd safe. That makes me feel good. Uh -huh. And you were sort of in a, you were in the opposite seat from where he was. Now tell me, first of all, what's a glider? What is glider, that, a glider? Mm -hmm. Gliders were going to be used to invade Europe, mm -hmm. and we were to be towed by a plane mm -hmm. and then cut loose, and then we were supposed to guide the glider in with, with a crew, mm -hmm. and of course they all had the guns, but they transferred us upon completion of that training to Pittsburgh, Kansas for further training in glider pilot. Mm -hmm. Then we were notified that the glider pilot program was not a success. I said, well, I don't know what a bombardier does, but it sounds like a pretty good uh, experience. <laughs> so I was transferred to Laredo, Texas for aerial gunnery. And then from that program, I was sent to bombardier school in Childers, Texas. Tell me a little bit about what bombardiers did. I was assigned to a B-17, mm -hmm. and we had 10 men crew. You 10 fellows were probably pretty close. Yeah. I would think. And so we became, <laughs> became pretty a pretty close. tight pack. <laughs> but, but from bombardier school, I was transferred to Tampa, Florida. And then our crew flew to uh, Savannah, Georgia, and we flew from there to Bangor, Maine, and then from Bangor, Maine to the Azores, mm -hmm. and then from the Azores to Marrakech in North Africa, and then from there to uh, Foggy, Italy, which was in the uh, lower part of Italy on the Adriatic. Well, this is Heroic Conversations. We'll be back in just a few minutes and find out what everyday life was like for these guys when they were out there during World War II. We'll be right back. The Foggia Airfield Complex was a series of World War II military airfields located within a 25-mile radius in the province of Foggia, Italy. You're watching Heroic Conversations with Alicia New. Brooks LaBeouf, Bennett Foster and Gortney is proud to sponsor Heroic Conversations. I'm Dean LaBeouf. Like our soldiers, we love this country and we fight hard to protect you and your legal rights. In fact, we believe you have too much at stake not to protect your legal rights. And I'm Scott Courtney. So if you've been seriously injured, have lost a loved one due to someone else's negligence, or have a family member who's been abused, neglected, or worse, call us. We handle serious injury and death cases throughout the southeastern United States. We want to help you get the justice you deserve, and there are no fees or costs unless we win. So call us at 850-222-2000 or go to our website, TooMuchAtStake.com. Our website is full of videos and articles designed to answer some of your most common legal questions. You can find Brooks LaBeouf, Bennett Foster, and Gortney at TooMuchAtStake.com. Let them fight for you. The Institute on World War II and the Human Dimension is a, is a major research collection devoted to documenting the human dimension of World War II. We have over 6,600 individual collections documenting the war. Probably our most well-known is, is the Tom Brokaw collection that he assembled uh, in, the, in the writing of The Greatest Generation. But we're also very much interested in sharing this collection with the world in attracting world-class scholars to make sure students use the collection and, and really to outreach to, to the general public. The USS Panamint was an amphibious force command ship named after the Panamint Range of Mountains in California.
Welcome back to Heroic Conversations. We have been finding out about their stories, their entrance to World War II and what they were thinking. And now we're gonna talk about the interesting parts of everyday life that a lot of people today don't really understand. Now, having grown up with my dad, I know that uh, you have some fun stories to talk about when it comes to food. It sounds fun to me now, but I'm sure it wasn't fun for you then. Yeah, we had good food in the Navy most of the time. Yeah. More especially on holidays. Man, they'd pick a, cook up a meal, it just wouldn't wait. But being over there about 20 months, uh, not that long, uh, they would uh, get bugs in all the flour. Mm -hmm. And when they'd make bread, you'd have to take your slice of bread and hold it up in the light and pick out the bugs. <laughs> I've got as many as 17 bugs out of one slice of bread to eat it. But one day I sort of missed that, getting the, one or two of the bugs out and it was a little crunchy. <laughs> and I thought about being back home with an old country boy and crackling bread. We'd kill <laughs> hogs and we'd take those cra uh, skins and make crackling bread. It was mighty good. <laughs> I said, what in the world am I doing picking out those bugs when it tastes like crackling bread? So I just started leading them in that bread. But I did lose from 200 and some pounds to 155 over Okinawa eating crackling bread. I guess so. What do, what do the guys do in the crew on a day-to-day -day basis to entertain themselves whenever they're out there? Out there, well, they, the biggest thing we did for entertainment was better on the side of the boat and watch the flying fish. Oh, yeah. They'd fly from one wave to the next. <laughs> now, I'd never heard of a fish doing that, so that was sort of interesting to see those fish <laughs> flying alongside the ship because our ship was a little longer than a football field. Wow. So we, we had a pretty good area to watch all the recreation that was mm -hmm. going on around that place. Up in the northern Pacific, uh, Pacific, those whales up there would come pretty close, oh, and wow. they would be shooting water up just like a water hose, uh, yeah. 20 to 30 feet up in the air. <laughs> a lot of you, know, you, learned, you learned a lot of things that you never had seen in South Georgia and North Florida. I guess that North Florida farm boy didn't know what he'd gotten into uh, probably at that point. Now tell me a little bit, you were in Italy well, is where you were well, stationed. I was in Italy. I lived in a four-man tent. Navigator, pilot, co-pilot, and bombardier. And we had to a make a stove that we had to build ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we had 100 octane gasoline in a 50 gallon drum right outside the tent. What um, kind of food did you have when you were on the ground? Well, we had pretty good food. We had a nice mess hall, and we had, a, we had several clubs there on the base, but we were stationed in an olive orchard and we were about 15, 20 miles north of Foggy, Italy, in a little, beautiful little town called La Cera. Mm -hmm. And we would visit with the Italians. We would go to their houses, and they would uh, come over and visit with us in our tent, see? So it was, it was, uh, and then we had a young Italian tile setter. And he came over and he says, let me put a, a nice tile floor in your tent. And so, <laughs> your tent. so we contracted with him okay. and I think we gave him cigarettes and, and uh, of course they gave you an allotment of, of uh, whiskey and beer and cigarettes. Mm -hmm. and, and so I didn't smoke, so I would trade cigarettes to him. <laughs> nice, and he put the beautiful tile floor with all tent. types of patterns and everything in there, you know? And so, That's of course, awesome. the, the tent wasn't much bigger than this right in here, and you had four, four, four uh, officers in the tent. Uh -huh. And we all got along real well. The USO would come and put on and shows And the USO for you would come to Foggy every now and then mm -hmm. and put on uh, shows for us, and we would go up to the uh, place. But we had one, one serious thing that happened. One of the gunners in our squadron and he was a close friend mm -hmm. and they would always announce if you go to town 
leave your gun. We had a 45 automatic. Everyone had a 45 automatic strapped on their hip. And it says, leave your guns at, at the base. Well, he went to base, off the base, and he went into a, an Italian restaurant, and he got drunk and he shot the restaurant all up. So he ended up in the brig, and he was stationed in, in a little tent, a little pup tent, and so we would have to go over there at night sometimes and play cards with him to keep him pacified. But I think it taught him a lesson mm -hmm. that uh, you just don't go to town and take your gun. Right. <laughs> leave it at home. <laughs> yeah, leave your gun at home. But, uh -huh. but this was a, it was an exciting time. Mm -hmm. And you really didn't realize what danger you were in until you started seeing planes blowing up and and plays coming down and all that, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we'll talk about some of those stories in just a minute. So stay tuned. You're on Heroic Conversations, and we'll be back in just a few minutes to hear more about those war stories when they were actually in combat. So we'll be back in a few minutes. The USO was founded in 1941 in response to a request from President Franklin D. Roosevelt to provide morale and recreation services to U.S. uniformed military personnel. Brooks LaBeouf, Bennett Foster, and Gortney is proud to sponsor Heroic Conversations. I'm Dean LaBeouf. Like our soldiers, we love this country and we fight hard to protect you and your legal rights. In fact, we believe you have too much at stake not to protect your legal rights. And I'm Scott Gortney. So if you've been seriously injured, have lost a loved one due to someone else's negligence, or have a family member who's been abused, neglected, or worse, call us. We handle serious injury and death cases throughout the southeastern United States. We want to help you get the justice you deserve, and there are no fees or costs unless we win. So call us at 850-222-2000 or go to our website, toomuchatstake.com. Our website is full of videos and articles designed to answer some of your most common legal questions. You can find Brooks LaBeouf, Bennett Foster, and Gortney at TooMuchAtStake.com. Let them fight for you. I just wanted to take a moment to say a special thank you to Hotel Duval and Hunter Hart Hospitality for hosting this beautiful room for our interviews, as well as a preview party that we had here. I also want to thank Dean LaBeouf and Scott Courtney for their support of this program, as well as the FSU Institute on World War II and the Human Experience, and of course, Frank Ranicki for the wonderful voiceovers that he did. Here at Hotel Duval, they have eight unique meeting spaces that are just as beautiful as this one. So I encourage you to check them out at hotelduval.com. This wouldn't have been possible unless all these amazing people came together. Thank you for watching Heroic Conversations right here on WTXL ABC 27. The Institute on World War II and the Human Dimension is a, is a major research collection devoted to documenting the human dimension of World War II. We have over 6,600 individual collections documenting the war. Probably our most well known is, is the Tom Brokaw collection that he assembled uh, in, the, in the writing of The Greatest Generation. But we're also very much interested in sharing this collection with the world in attracting world-class scholars to make sure students use the collection and, and really to outreach to, to the general public. The Tuskegee Airmen were the first African-American military aviators in the United States Armed Forces. Despite racial discrimination within and outside of the military, they trained and flew with distinction. Welcome back to Heroic Conversations. We've been having a great time talking to these World War II vets, and now we're going to talk about the serious stuff all the combat that they saw and the effect that it had on them and the adventure and danger that they were actually in is what this whole section is about. Now, Mr. Meadows, you were up in the air, so you probably saw a lot of combat. Yeah. One of the missions that I was on, we made a mission from Foggia, Italy, all the way to Berlin. We had the Tuskegee Airmen. They flew as cover for us, wow. and they would chase the German pilots away. 
and we would constantly have conversations with some of them and they were really good because you could hear them talking to each other and one of them would say well I got the last one now it's your turn to get this <laughs> one he's coming in <laughs> and on the way coming back from Berlin we had two engines shot out on our plane so the pilot says it looks like we're uh, going to have to bail out so uh, they said first thing we need to do is start throwing out everything we could throw out on the out of the plane to lighten the load but when we got back over the Adriatic I looked down and I could see water and I told the pilot because it was an undercast and you you really didn't know what was beneath you and when I saw just a little hole in the cloud cover and I could see the Adriatic Sea and I said we're over the Adriatic and I was already at the uh, escape hatch and my heart was up in my I think it was up in my mouth I and uh, I could see that we didn't have to bail out mm -hmm. and, uh, and I told the pilot I said and so he did everything he could to keep the plane going until it got right close to the base and then another engine went out but we crash landed on the base with one engine and of course no one was hurt or anything but when we got down we found holes all in the plexiglass in the mm. front and it got so bad in the front down in the with the navigator in the bombardier compartment but we landed safely and uh, and that's when the USO met us at the plane and, and gave you a big drink of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Probably needed it to calm yeah, your nerves yeah, at that point. Yeah. And that's actually what the map is that you have there. In this case map, you had to bail out, they this, have this, this map. map is a is a silk map mm -hmm. of the area. And this map was probably uh, made in the early 40s. Mm -hmm. And this map is a map of the area where we were, were doing most of the flying. Mm -hmm. And if you bailed out, this map would help you return back to the base right and you could follow this uh silk map and you could put it in your pocket mm -hmm. and uh which was a big help and you almost got to use it that day it yeah, sounds like <laughs> almost I, I thought about it that day now i know when you were out in the water you had several close calls we, we had a lot of close calls but the lord was with us mm -hmm. and i know when i first got over there on april the first of 44 I was on the, the night shift all that time. The bombers, the Japs sent their bombers down and they were dropping the bombs. Uh, one bomber got pretty close to the ship and went under the ship and blew up down there. It just shook the whole ship. That sort of unnerved me a little bit. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, what in the world am I doing over here? But it seemed like he came to me just that second. And it eased all my pains, and from then on I was relaxed and I could do anything I wanted to do and wasn't afraid of anything. And I, I became a man right then from, from 17 to 18 year old boy. But it was, it was all real exciting. But mm -hmm. one of the most uh, important things to me was uh, we had, a, I was on a flagship the Amphibious Group Command. And those Japs would give their last nickel to locate us. We moved every night to a different location. And any time that the uh, planes were coming in, we made smoke. And they couldn't see what was under them. They didn't know where we were. But they finally figured out where we were located. So this plane, on one Sunday, came in right by itself, and he started diving for us. And the minister was over on the IE Shima right by Okinawa, was gonna come aboard the whole service. And he saw that plane diving for us. But just before he got to us, one of our 20 millimeter guns happened to hit the pilot, and he pulled back on the stick and shot over the top of us and hit them in the water. And the Catholic boys that went to service, he told them, your mothers back home surely must have been praying for you 
to have their plane miss you like that. Right, yeah. Well, if you think about all the danger that you guys were in, you talk about it being exciting, you know what I mean, because you were so young at the time. But it's a miracle, you know what I mean, really, that you survived all that combat that you were in. And here you are, you know, 86 and 91, and still able to tell these stories. You said, too, that when you left, you decided that you wanted to get married before you went off to war. Well, I was married in Childers, Texas. <clears throat> when we finished back from the war, I enrolled at, uh, on the GI Bill at the University of Florida, mm -hmm. and she wanted to go to college, and they said, well, it's only boys. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to go to Tallahassee if you want to go to college. But anyway, so finally, they opened the school up for girls. Yeah, well, Dad has a fun story about your, when you went to tell them about you going to FSU. About the girls, you mean? Right. <laughs> well, at that time, it was 2,700 girls out there and, and <laughs> 700 of us boys. <laughs> you didn't have any trouble to get a date. <laughs> but when you first uh, came to FSU, was it called FSU? No, Florida State College for Women. Yeah, so you actually yeah. were in one of the first classes of men. Yeah, it, it was yeah. a nice. You'd go to class and there'd be a 20 four or five girls and I three or four boys. <laughs> that was a pretty good place to be after being at war for so long though. When you come back and are in a oh, nice yeah. girls school. So your 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 wife could, had to go to a boys school and he had to go to a girls school. Yeah. <laughs> but these, these were the these were the times when I went to university there was only thirty five hundred students and the majority of them were returning uh, veterans from World War Two. How long were you in the military and then you went on to ROTC you said? Well I was in the military from 1942 mm -hmm. until actually 1971, and I was a member of the Air Force Reserve, and we met in the ROTC building, and uh, we had a pretty big class of uh, World War II at FSU, mm -hmm. which was interesting. Mm -hmm. Great, and after, after the war, after you went to college for a few years, what did you decide to do? I wound up on the farm, <laughs> raising a little bit of everything from cane to watermelon. Yeah, and how many years? You just were just closed down your fertilizer business. Mm. Yeah, I had a liquid fertilizer plant, but uh, after 45 years, it was a metal plant, and I'm, I was getting pretty old, couldn't hardly get around anyhow. I had my knees replaced, and open heart surgery, and all those good things. So I just decided I'd quit. So, <laughs> At 86, so my, it was about time. <laughs> I I'm out in the cold now. <laughs> right. Well, you can see why this is called the greatest generation. Thank you for spending time with us today. This has been Heroic Conversations, and we hope to do this again for you very soon.